Ken Langston. Okay, perfect. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, every, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for sitting around listening to me, drinking some coffee. Hopefully some of you are drinking uh, some coffee and maybe some beer as well. Uh, it's pretty early in the morning here. I'm in Boston and the US. Um, so this is my PhD work. I'm not currently working on uh, the glycerol phosphate shuttle, but I'm excited to talk about it. Uh, I think it's a very interesting avenue in uh, immune metabolism, which you've heard about already from Luke. Uh, we will start a little bit um, reductionist though, before going into the particular topic that I studied uh, for my PhD. And that is uh, to look at a biological system as just a series of modules. And this is actually terminology that was put forth by Ruslan Metsatov, uh, who's a great myeloid biologist, probably one of the greatest of our time. Um, and he refers to a stress as an inducer. Um, and then the, si the system that's being stressed as an effector that then affects a mediator to uh, respond to whatever the inducer is. And we can all appreciate that for uh, an appropriate response or appropriate access between inducers and mediators, uh, you need sensors that can calibrate uh, specific mediators responses to uh, specific inducers. And in an immunologic context, which is uh, my field, immunology, you can rename these and think about them as stress in the form of infection or injury. Uh, the sensors are receptors that are expressed on the effectors, which in this case are leukocytes or white blood cells. Uh, and then the mediators could be all sorts of things, but cl classically we think about cytokines, uh, chemokines, and lipid mediators that are uh, secreted and communicate between cells uh, and also across tissues. So there are loops that exist between these modules. You can appreciate as well that cytokines and chemokines can act back on receptors and back on leukocytes uh, in a positive or negative fashion. But ultimately the goal of all of this is to uh, reduce the infection, to eliminate the infection, or uh, recover from injury. And so that's why I had that little negative sign here showing that ultimately the loop is to uh, respond to whatever the stressor is and eliminate it from the system. So immune metabolism that Luke mentioned previously is essentially the same axis in immunology with a few additional modules. So it's studying how diet and hormones uh, affect host metabolism and how host metabolism in turn affect the metabolism of leukocytes either uh, directly through substrate utilization or through signaling uh, through receptors as uh, well as as mediators acting as ligands for receptors uh, and then how the chemokine uh, and cytokine responses they maybe act back on metabolism but then ultimately again all of this works together to eliminate infection or respond to injury or just respond to whatever the inducer in your context is so we study macrophages in the system so those are our effector cells and macrophages are a very ancient form of host defense that are true invertebrates and invertebrates and they arise from progenitor cells that, differ, that differ, differentiate in the presence of this hormone called MCSF to give you macrophages. Uh, and macrophages are ubiquitous. They're in practically every tissue in the body. This is uh, from a special mouse called a Mac green mouse. You can see the key here for all these different tissues. But essentially where you see green is just an endogenously encoded reporter for cells that express the receptor for this MCSF. So you're only seeing green where you have macrophages and you've got uh, macrophages in spleen, brain, eye, uh, the testes, the bone, the epidermis, um, everywhere. So they play a very vital role in homeostasis of tissues as well as responding to uh, inducers like injury and infection. So uh, there is also an important system feature which is not only the differentiation from one cell type to another but also the response in terms of change of cell state to account for whatever the inducer is. So in this example I have here, you have a bacterial species or a bacterial structure called lipopolysaccharide that's on the outer uh, membrane of bacteria. That's the inducer and it, uh, signals for macrophages to, transi to transition into uh, an active classical effector cell, uh, an M1 macrophage that produces pro-inflammatory mediators and also antimicrobial species. And why is this important? Well, if you look at the pro-inflammatory response to LPS, uh, you have this uh, critical biphasic response. So initially macrophages are programmed to an M1 state where they produce a lot of pro-inflammatory mediators, such as the ones I've shown here. Uh, but then over time, and we're talking maybe 20, 24 hours plus, uh, there's a protracted period of immunosuppression where macrophages are actually uh, decreasing the expression for IL-6 and IL-1 beta, which are pro-inflammatory, and increasing the expression of anti-inflammatory mediators and turning on other functions like phagocytosis. And remarkably, if macrophages in this, in this second state, this red state, after primary encounter, re-encounter the same uh, species like LPS, then they're profoundly tolerant. And the reason why this exists is because if you look at a model in humans uh, for the response to LPS, uh, you see the same trend. So there's an acute pro-inflammatory response that is important for clearing the infection, but then after the course of the infection uh, has been cleared, 
uh, there's a period of immunosuppression so that the uh, inflammatory response doesn't actually damage the host's tissues. So this might be considered a septic shock phase, and this is an immunosuppressive phase to, um, to uh, mitigate the shock phase and protect the host from destroying its own tissues. And all this work that I'm going to go through about the glycerol phosphate shuttle is published. Um, I don't know if everyone has access to Nature Immunology. Um, it was in the 2019 issue back in August. And there's also a nice preview by Mike Murphy, who Luke uh, mentioned, uh, that summarizes things quite nicely. Um, if you actually don't have access, you can go to my Twitter, which is just my name. And I have a pinned tweet that's a free access link to the article. But essentially, in a nutshell, we're going to go through this. But uh, we demonstrated that there is a glycolytic shuttle that enhances the utilization of glucose that allows carbons to go through the TCA cycle and into acetyl-CoA to allow histone modifications to activate transcription at pro-inflammatory genes. And this is the acetyl -CoA. Can I just interrupt you for a second? Yeah. Sorry about that. If you look uh, under your slides, under where it says macrophage, there's a little pointer. If you click that, you can change it to a from a private pointer to a regular pointer. Oh, I see. I got you. Perfect. Okay, now we great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And so I'm, I'm alluding to the acetyl-CoA acetylation axis that Luke mentioned earlier. And uh, the take-home points that I want to mention are that there are uh, metabolic shifts that are coupled to cell state shifts, that these shifts in metabolism are gene-specific, so that uh, certain gene sets respond to different substrates dependent pathways, that one metabolic module can actually regulate multiple cell states. And I don't think we're going to have time, but I also had some stuff about thermodynamics which people don't really think about in biological context too often, but uh, is important in macrophage amino metabolism. Um, we have a review that's a little old now as well that basically summarizes these papers that I have here that if the slides are available later, you should definitely take a look at. But essentially they all lead to this same phenotype, which is that in activated macrophages that are pro-inflammatory, as Luke also mentioned, there's an increase in glycolysis that uh, partially produces lactate, but also produces pyruvate that goes into the TCA cycle. And that, uh, Lactate is the primary um, end product of glycolysis in this context because the mitochondria are dysfunctional. And so you don't actually get the full TCA cycling that you would get in a normal cell state because there are these breaks. So I have here break one between isocitrate and alpha ketoglutarate and break two between succinate and fumarate. Um, but this is, actually isn't quite true. This depends on what time you look after activation of macrophages. So if you look over the time course uh, from early activation to late activation, you can see, looking at glucose uptake, there's a gradual increase in glucose uptake. And if you look at this second portion of this graph of cellular acidification of the media, which is influenced primarily in our context by lactate production, there's a time-dependent increase in lactate production. And consistently also with the literature, if you look at a later time point, like 12 hours, uh, respiration, shown uh, white versus black and naive versus LPS-treated cells in this part of the graph and also in this part of the graph, shown here, and here is bar graphs, respiration has decreased. And so there is this commitment to Warburg metabolism at later time points after LPS, where respiration is down and glycolysis is increased. But actually, if you look at very early time points uh, for respiration, there is an acute increase at around one hour that then is followed by this precipitous, this precipitous drop that's very well characterized in the literature. And so there's this dynamic response of respiration to activation that depends on how long the cells have seen. In this case, this is macrophages that have been given LPS. Uh, and this mirrors the responsiveness that I mentioned before. So initially, macrophages are very responsive to LPS. They make a lot of pro-inflammatory cytokines. This timing overlays with the one-hour time point, actually. So you might say that actually respiration could support this increase in pro-inflammatory cytokines. But it's in this later phase where they become refractory to secondary challenge that respiration is impaired. We wanted to figure out why uh, respiration changes this way. And so I went through a bunch of experiments to test different metabolic pathways and how they affect respiration. And we found that if you inhibit glycolysis, you attenuate the uh, LPS inducible increase in respiration. So shown here is the basal respiration and also here is the maximal respiration at one hour. But also at later time points, you protect against the decrease in respiration by treating with uh, a um, glycolysis inhibitor called 2-deoxyglucose, 2-DG. And so inhibiting glucose oxidation counterbalances the increase in respiration with the decrease in respiration to sort of even out the change in respiration over time after LPS. And this is uh, concomitant with an acute uh, inhibition of pro-inflammatory cytokine production at one hour, one hour to three hours. So IL-6 and IL-1-beta are attenuated by treating with LPS as you also attenuate respiration at one hour. But then at later time points, so this is a little, little bit complicated, but essentially if you compare cells that are unstimulated to cells that are stimulated for uh, just four hours with LPS, you can see green to green that there is uh, an acute increase in pro-inflammatory cytokines. 
but that if you were to treat cells with LPS for 24 hours and then come back and re-stimulate these tolerant cells with LPS, so that's the red to red comparison, you can see that uh, there's a pronounced uh, refractoriness to re-challenge. And that's, you can also see between these two bars for IL-6 and also for IL-1 beta, that's the, that's the tolerance in terms of the response to the secondary challenge. But treating with 2DG during this priming with LPS, because it's attenuating the initial response, actually restores responsiveness to secondary challenges with LPS. And so in this way, we actually have a revised model for how uh, metabolism supports macrophage activation. And that is that you have to consider the two cell, cell states separately. So the activated macrophage that's pro-inflammatory is responsive and has actually an increase in respiration uh, with relatively low glycolysis. And then that transitions to a later tolerant state, which is actually quite low in pro-inflammatory cytokine production and is unresponsive to secondary challenges that is deficient in respiration and high for glycolysis. And uh, very quickly, I'll go through this next phase. Uh, we tried to find out a mechanism that links glycolysis to gene induction. Uh, that's, as Luke also mentioned, uh, uh, in some cases, acetylation. So we showed that inhibiting glucose utilization with a pharmacologic agent, this 2DG, attenuates his, uh, promoter region histone acetylation at IL-6 and also for IL-1 beta. And also depriving cells of glucose does the same thing. So in glucose-free media, the increase in acetylation at pro-inflammatory um, cytokine gene promoters is attenuated, which also attenuates their uh, their transcription because acetylation is a transcription activating event. And this is actually, this axis was described first by Katie Wellen in a science paper showing that this enzyme ACL1 is important for making uh, acetyl-CoA from citrate that's derived from nutrients like glucose and amino acids. And that this pool of acetyl-CoA made by uh, ACLY is important for histone acetylation. Um, it was also shown in 2013 by Infantino and colleagues that ACLY expression on the mRNA level is increased by LPS. So what we went on to show is that if you look at this reaction, so if you trace glucose into citrate or you trace glucose into acetyl-CoA during uh, an acute LPS stimulation of macrophages, you have an increase shown here by the white bars, an increase in the labeling of glucose into acetyl-CoA. So glucose is going in here and through the TCA cycle, TCA cycle into citrate and acetyl-CoA. This is permitted because uh, ACLY phosphorylation is actually enhanced quite rapidly and stays on for several hours to permit uh, this, uh, this reaction to proceed. And if you trace glucose all the way into histones that we're saying are modified by acetyl-CoA to activate transcription, you can see here at three hours of LPS stimulation, there's an increase in corporation of glucose-derived carbons into acetylated histones. So this, this pathway is on in LPS-activated macrophages and these M1 macrophages. And uh, there's also a recent paper that I want to point out that came out in Immunity After Hours that shows the same thing. They show that uh, ACOI phosphorylation is enhanced by LPS stimulation, but that in um, cells that are deficient in the machinery for responding to LPS, this is not true. I'll skip this. I'm just showing that this axis is true downstream as well. So we've shown that acetylation is enhanced during LPS activation to turn on pro-inflammatory genes, and this is dependent on glucose oxidation. In the paper, we also show that the opposite is true for tolerant macrophages. And so the working model is here, this is in the supplement of the paper, but essentially during activation, glucose is used to drive respiration and TCA cycling for acetyl-CoA that's needed to activate transcription by histone acetylation. But during tolerance, all these things are turned down and that's why the cells seem to be refractory to secondary challenges. So uh, the, I'll quickly try to go through the next part. This is the third section. Uh, how does this happen? What is the mechanism that's coordinating this shift from activation to tolerance? And we had an unbiased approach because we weren't quite sure what the answer was. We did metabolic profiling at steady state with no tracing, just measuring metabolites as they are, what the, what the levels are. And we compared three hours activated macrophages to unstimulated macrophages. And so the most interesting pathways I'll highlight here in red, but actually the most enriched pathway uh, in terms of the metabolites that were increased after LPS stimulation was this glycerol phosphate shuttle, which is actually not characterized at all in macrophages. Um, and what the shuttle essentially is, is a way to get electrons from glycolysis directly into the mitochondrial respiratory chain. So one of the intermediates of glycolysis is oxidized and electrons are placed on this electron acceptor uh, NAD to make NADH. And then another recipient molecule, dihydroxyacetone phosphate, is then reduced by the NADH to make glycerol 3-phosphate, which is the substrate for this enzyme GPD-2, the rate-limiting enzyme of the shuttle. And then GPD-2 is actually part of the respiratory chain and drives respiration uh, or what you, what you call electron transport. And so essentially what we saw is that after LPS activation, uh, the first enzyme of the shuttle, GPD-1, is not that different, but GPD-2 is uh, dramatically enhanced in its expression. And the substrate, glycerol-3-phosphate, as shown here as the bar height, is also uh, dramatic, dramatically increased 
in total level and also in labeling from glucose after LPS stimulation. We made knockout macrophages that are deficient in GPT-2, and we showed that the acute increase in respiration by LPS at one hour is attenuated to GPT-2 knockout macrophages, showing that GPT-2 might be driving this increase in respiration. Uh, and this is true for basal respiration and also the uncoupled maximal respiration, the sort of a cell capacity to respond to stress. And this is also true for inflammatory cytokine production. So uh, as you saw with 2DG, 2DG inhibits uh, the increase in uh, respiration and the increase in cytokine production. You see as well that GP2 deficiency inhibits the increase in respiration and also inhibits the increase in IL-6 production and IL-1 beta production and also histone acetylation of the promoters for these genes. It's not working, okay. And the opposite is true for respiration. This is also the same as the 2DG data. So you protect against the decrease in respiration. And in the paper, we show that the cells are uh, the cells are more responsive to rechallenge. What I wanted to show you is if you go into mice and you do the same priming and rechallenge system that I showed in cells previously. So you either give mice a vehicle for 24 hours, which for us was just saline, uh, or LPS, a sublethal dose for 24 hours, and you rechallenge them. The mice that, that get no pre uh, pre treatment are lethally injected by LPS, they succumb, but the mice to get the pre-injection to LPS because of LPS tolerance leading to this uh, uh, immunosuppressive phase are protected and they don't and they don't succumb. So if you look at IL-6, the mice that uh, get the sublethal injection uh, for pretreatment um, here have a high level of IL-6, and if you re-challenge them, so you give them two doses of LPS, they're refractory. So this is the same thing that I showed in vitro, whereas the knockout mice uh, do not have the same decrease in LPS production uh, in, induced by um, LPS pretreatment. And so on here, if you look at wild type mice that get LPS pretreatment, they don't succumb to a lethal dose of LPS, but knockout mice that are preconditioned with LPS and then treated with a lethal dose do succumb. So not having GPT-2 uh, makes you sensitive to uh, septic shock induced, uh, ins induced death. And skip this. So very briefly, because I saw someone asking me about the, the thermodynamics, so I do want to say that this is very often overlooked, but the mitochondrial respiratory chain is um, beautifully ordered. And it's basically ordered by what we call the redox potential, or you could also bend this as the propensity to donate or receive electrons. And so the way that it's ordered is uh, from negative to positive redox potential. So species that want to give electrons, and I'm almost done, species that want to give electrons are at the beginning, species that want to receive electrons are at the end. So oxygen is the terminal uh, recipient of electrons in the respiratory chain. And this sort of pulls electrons through the chain. And uh, this is also thermodynamically um, um, supported in the sense that if you have a big separation between the redox potential of two things, the delta EH, so for instance, complex one versus complex three, uh, there's a negative delta G. So it's favorable to donate electrons down this gradient of redox potential. And in a, in a nutshell, oh, this is bad. Okay, well, I don't know why that, uh, why that looks wrong. So in a nutshell, what we showed in the paper, you can go take a look at with, uh, without the issue with, this, um, with the figure, is that in activation, there's forward electron transport that drives the increase in respiration, but the thermodynamics supports a shift from forward electron transport to reverse electron transport that actually uh, leads to redox imbalance and inhibition of respiration and inhibition of uh, gene induction. And so that's, that's described better in the paper than I was able to do here with my, uh, with my figure not working. But essentially, if you go through the steps, um, I'm just showing that the change in, in sensitivity to LPS and the responsiveness to LPS is coordinated with changes in metabolic uh, shifts. That there's substrate specificity, so glucose supports the activation of pro-inflammatory genes by this acetyl-CoA uh, histone acetylation axis, although there are other me mechanisms as, as well. As Sylvia Gavan will talk about, uh, metabolites can modify mRNAs and also modify other proteins. Um, yeah, I don't know why uh, there's an issue here. Maybe it's something about the presentation mode. But I do want to thank my collaborators. Uh, I'm not in this lab anymore, but I was in Tiffany Hong's lab, previously at Harvard. Now she's at Shanghai Tech University. Uh, and all the people in the lab who helped me along the way, I think John Jung is listening to this talk. The other laboratories that were at Harvard that helped me at the time. Um, wonderful mitochondrial biologist, Ed Chutani, and also Renata Gonclaves. And then my collaborators did, did metabolomics with us uh, at Drexel and also at Duke. And uh, yeah, that's, that's the presentation. Please take a look at the paper. I think it does a better job than I just did of explaining in uh, 20 minutes. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Kent Langston. So we do have a quick question. So the question that we'll be going over now is, do the tolerized macrophages have memory and is it known how long they persist? <laughs> 
Yeah, I think that's a great question. And uh, actually the project started based on my interest in uh, myeloid cell memory. And I think that some people probably would call LPS tolerance immunologic memory. Um, I started off calling it that, but to answer both questions in one, I think LPS tolerance is probably not sufficient to be called uh, memory because it is reversible. So if you treat cells with LPS for let's say 72 hours, you start to see a natural recovery of responsiveness. And also if you do 24 hours of simulation to wash off LPS, and let them recover in media for a while, they regain responsiveness quite rapidly to LPS. And so there is a, a persistent need for LPS exposure. And in that sense, it's not memory, but response to TH2 cytokines like uh, IL-4 and IL-13 um, does lead to stable changes in the epigenome that leads to stable changes in responsiveness. And that would be, I think we call that trend immunity, but that is also, um, uh, immunologic memory. But I think LPS tolerance is probably just a transient form of memory that's just important during the host response to, to bacterial stimulation acutely. Awesome. Thank you very much. So now we'll just get you to sign off and we will welcome Dr. Sylvia Galvan-Pena from Trinity College.